Welcome to Community Roundtable. I'm Nick Burns from the Salt Lake Community College Division of Communication and Performing Arts. And I'm your host as we explore topics of special interest and concern to the residents of the cities and also the unincorporated areas of Salt Lake County. Topics that we believe are equally important to the general public throughout all the state of Utah. And today, our topic is healthcare in Utah. Our governor, Gary Herbert, has his Healthy Utah plan, while others across Utah prefer a straight-up Medicaid expansion. Still others say neither plan is acceptable for Utah. Meanwhile, the sick and the healthy continue to debate. On the show today, we talk with Utah filmmaker Paul Gibbs, who has a new documentary about the need to expand Medicaid in Utah. We'll also talk about the governor's Healthy Utah plan with Danny Harris from AARP. So today on Community Roundtable, it's health care for the uninsured. Is it a personal issue or a social responsibility? So thanks for joining us. Paul Gibbs, Utah filmmaker. Hi, thanks for having me here. Graduate of our film program here? Um, I haven't graduated yet. Oh, so well, don't tell me that. Okay. <laughs> close to graduating. Yes, very okay. close. Okay. Thank you. And Danny Harris, you're the Associate uh, Advocacy Policy Person for AARP. That's right. Thanks for having me. You, my pleasure. And you're up on the hill, I take it, probably mostly. Most of my time's up on the hill. That's okay. correct. Yeah. Well, thank you to both of you. Paul, I, I, I want to start off with you here. You know, in the film, mostly you let people tell their own health care stories. And you have doctors and you have politicians and so on. Yes. Um, but as a place to begin, I have a little clip that I want to run for folks. And then when we get back, I want to talk about it. So let's okay. roll that clip, please. I see people and meet people all the time who don't have health care coverage who have difficult things, uh, sometimes terrible things happen to them because they didn't have coverage that could have had coverage if we would have had Medicaid. Odds are there are lots of people just like me who are very sick, who could be terminally ill, who have no medical care, who are going to lose their lives because they do not have access to basic health care. With every passing day, the sky goes darker gray. Alone, uh, going through a divorce, completely bankrupt for a stroke I didn't even have. Well, people think Marines don't cry, but they do. Why is it wrong to help each other? I could change the world if I could just get some medicine. My brother, God is love, can we love one another? So that's a clip from Paul Gibbs' film entitled To Life with us today, Paul Gibbs and also Danny Harris from AARP. So in, you know, in the film, Paul, you have politicians, you have doctors, you have a number of people who've benefited from, from Medicaid here in Utah, but you yourself, you call health care a miracle. Yes, for me it absolutely was when I went through the experience five years ago of needing a kidney transplant. I, I had no idea where this health care was going to come from because I was uninsured at the time. I was was working part-time, going to Salt Lake Community College part-time and working as a full-time care provider for my niece and nephew who I lived with and I didn't have insurance and I had no idea how I was going to be able to get that surgery. So for me it was the answer to a lot of prayers. It was It was a miracle to me. And you ended up having someone donate a kidney? Yes, a friend wow. donated a kidney. And Medicaid paid for the surgery? Medicaid, a combination of Medicaid and Medicare. Okay. And stage kidney failure is one of the few options that gets a person in my age range Medicare coverage. So it was a combination of the two. Okay. So in essence, because you were a youth, because you were younger, you qualified? Well, anybody in end stage kidney failure can qualify okay. for Medicare coverage. Usually Medicare coverage is for somebody older than, than my age at the time but because of those circumstances, because I was in end stage okay. kidney failure. Okay, so Danny Harris, bring you in here. The, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, ACA, uh, Obamacare to many people, even the president now, I guess. We have 27 states plus Washington, D.C. that have expanded and gone with this Medicaid expansion. Utah now has this healthy Utah plan. So as a place to begin, what's Medicaid mean currently for Utah? with the situation we're in now for folks? So how Medicaid operates now for people is that it's basically categorical eligibility, right? You, you, 
first of all, the criteria is you have to be low income pretty much across the board. Okay. Uh, but you also have to meet another special health criteria, whether that's a disability or if you are a, a pregnant woman or children often uh, is, is a qualifier for them as well. And the elderly also qualify for Medicaid if they're low income. However, there are a lot of people who don't qualify for <coughs> Medicaid even when they are low income. Uh, those would be, if you, if you are an adult without children, it doesn't matter how much money you make, you don't qualify for Medicaid in Utah. If you are a parent um, and low income, if you make more than 50% or half of the poverty level, you don't qualify for, uh, for Medicaid. So uh, it's, it's difficult as an, a relatively healthy adult, although you may have some minor health conditions, to qualify for Medicaid, even if you're low income in Utah. 50% of the poverty line, that's not much. For an individual, it's roughly six thousand dollars a year. If you if you make more than that, uh, you wouldn't qualify for Medicaid in Utah as, a, as an adult with uh, a child. So five hundred bucks a month. Right. Wow. Okay. So, for folks that aren't covered now under Medicaid, again, like you say, they're the people that aren't. What do they do for health care? Do they just die, or what's available? Uh, you know. <clears throat> It's a, it's a good question and one that many people wonder about. <coughs> the, the answer is oftentimes is that they seek care in the emergency room. Um, when when they're con they will delay care for as long as possible because they can't afford to pay for it out of their own pocket. And so uh, once their conditions get so bad, they'll go to the emergency room and they'll receive uh, very costly care there. Uh, for example, someone who has diabetes may neglect having insulin shots and things like that until their condition gets so bad that they then have to go in for an amputation or more se severe treatments, right? Uh, so it, it's not only more costly to provide care that way, it's less effective and uh, for the, the individual and reduces quality of life as well. Well, yeah, it makes sense. So for these ER visits that are so expensive, who, who's paying for that? Those, you would think that the uh, hospitals would cover the cost of that. They call it charity care. Uh, but it, it really isn't charity care. Those things are made up for with other costs within the health care system. So those of us who uh, have private health insurance, who uh, get our insurance through our employer and pay premiums from month to month, those premiums are higher because there are people who are uninsured and who go into the hospitals and get that uncompensated care. Uh, each of us pays, the, pays for that care in higher taxes and higher premiums and higher health care costs all around. Okay, so, I mean, you'll have to take me through this and call me silly or call me dumb, but to me that seems like a no-brainer. Why not take the Medicaid money? <laughs> I mean, it would be cheaper. More people would have coverage. Folks like me who have good health care coverage would pay less. I mean, what's not to like here? Well, and, and to sweeten the pot a little bit, too, that the federal government pays for more than for this Medicaid expansion than for traditional Medicaid uh, anyway. They've, uh, the federal government has agreed to uh, pay for the cost of uh, Medicaid expansion 100% for the first three years and phase that down to the, the fact that they'll pay 90% in perpetuity in 2020 and on. Traditionally in Utah, we pay, the state pays about 30% of the cost for Medicaid and the federal government pays about 70. So beyond all the good things that come along with it, the federal government is offering you to even pay more. Uh, there's concern, the, the major concerns that policymakers bring up is uh, do we want to be beholden to the federal government for this money uh, and will the federal government at some point back out of this, this agreement? Um, the, the fact is, is that Utah taxpayers are paying for uh, the Medicaid expansion right now whether we expand Medicaid or not in new taxes that have come for, with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and we have to determine if we want to bring those tax dollars back to Utah to pay for care for the, the low-income citizens. And most of the states around us ha are among those 27. I mean, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, I think everybody around us, but and Wyoming. Yeah, and, and Idaho are st still two states that are still uh, considering this. Okay. Paul, um, jump in. Well, I think you covered exact. you ask wh what's not like, what this seems like a no-brainer. I think in introducing the topic, you covered exactly what's not to like, what the opposition's about when you said some people call it Obamacare. It's about ideology. There's, my experience is that the vast majority of opposition to this is ideologically based. And a lot of it is about resentment of the Affordable Care Act and about feeling like this is our opportunity as a state to stand up and say, we don't like the Affordable Care Act and we don't like Barack Obama. Well, there are a lot of people in positions of authority that I may not like, but I'm not going to let anyone 
go without health care or die to send that message. But I feel like that is what we, or those who have been opposing Medicaid expansion or Healthy Utah are doing, is actually putting lives in danger to send a political message. Interesting. So if it was Romney care, everything would be okay? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Gosh, we need to do a quick break here on Community Roundtable, talking with local filmmaker Paul Gibbs, talking with Danny Harris from AARP. When we come back, I want to get into this notion of the ideology of this, and specifically I want to talk about Governor Herbert's Healthy Utah plan, because Utah does have a solution here in the works. So keep it tuned. We'll be right back with more Community Roundtable. We are back on Community Roundtable talking with Danny Harris from AARP here in Utah. He's an advocate, Associate State Director of Advocacy for AARP, and also with us, Paul Gibbs, Salt Lake Community College film student and the director-producer of Entitled to Life. So, Danny, we left off talking about Medicaid in Utah. Coming back here, tell me about the Healthy Utah plan that Governor Herbert is uh, currently very close to having some sort of agreement with the feds and wants to bring back to the legislature. Sure. So for the last two years, our state has been studying what, what we can or could do in Utah. Uh, quickly, it was ruled out that a traditional Medicaid expansion, like many other states have done, was not an option here in Utah. There just wasn't uh, the desire from uh, le legislators and from the governor to put more people on the, the rolls of Medicaid, uh, the government, a government-run program that they, they feel like they have issues with already anyway. Do you agree with Paul's notion that that's largely ideological here? In general, yeah, I think I think it is. I think uh, Medicaid is a well-run program in our state. It has low administrative costs. It is, uh, in terms of providing care to people, it has the lowest cost per person of pretty much any other program out there. Interesting. Um, but there there are concerns uh, from legislators that if we put more people on government programs, that it takes away from the private market. Uh, that doctors won't get reimbursed as well because people are on Medicaid plans which which reimburse lower doctors lower than a, a private insurance company pays uh, and so that that was one of the foundation the foundations of the healthy Utah plan was to strengthen the the private insurance market and and part of the reason that they wanted to do that was the fear that if we put more people on Medicaid that doctors will start saying well I'm not going to take any more Medicaid patients because they don't pay me as well as other plans do and that, that fear has been around for a long time. Uh, whether or not that would have played out, I guess, is anyone's guess. Uh, but the, the governor's first position was we, we need to make sure that we do this through expanding the private market rather than putting people on government plans. But the governor also did realize that we're sending <coughs> $258 million a year in Utah taxpayer dollars to pay for the Medicaid expansion and we're not bringing that back in. So he wanted to be respectful to taxpayers and make sure that we brought as much of that money that we're paying back to the state for this type of a program. Okay. So, so that, that was his, his impetus was, you know, we, we've got to bring this taxpayer dollars back. We're already paying for this. And we've got a major problem that we need to address here in the state. I think the governor is conscientious that we do have tens of thousands of people in the state that are going without health coverage, that are getting care in the emergency room. And not only does it affect those people who can't get care, but it affects every, all the rest of us, like we mentioned earlier, who are paying for it two and three times over. Uh, so his plan is now, instead of putting them into Medicaid plans, is to put them into private insurance plans and to have them put some skin in the game, as they call it, which would basically be um, higher co-pays than what, traditionally what uh, a Medicaid beneficiary would pay. So when you go to a doctor's office, you would pay more upfront than you would pay on, on, on Medicaid to go in and see the doctor. And they're also looking at trying to incentivize people to be working and trying to not be uh, staying on Medicaid forever, staying in that low income bracket, but that they're uh, gainfully employed and trying to chip in towards their care as well. So essentially, it sounds like Governor Herbert wants the Medicaid money and then he wants to administer it, administer it differently here by basically giving it to private insurers to cover these folks. So you run up the overhead cost. Will the same number of people get coverage? The same number of people will get coverage. It would cover the same uh, group of people that a traditional Medicaid expansion will cost, but you're exactly right. It is more administratively difficult uh, to ad administer something like that. And when, it's, when there's more administration involved, the costs go up for something like that. So does that mean less care? I mean, something's gotta give. 
it seems. I, th I think what you will see is it will, it will be more costly than doing a traditional Medicaid expansion. Um, and, and that's one of the trade-offs that, that we have to make when we opt to go with a private insurance company rather than traditional Medicaid. Paul, did you have something you wanted to add there as well? Oh, um, well, earlier in the discussion, I, I just wanted to be clear that it was understood that this money we're paying out in taxes for the Medicaid expansion, that money is going out whether we bring, whether we bring it back here or not. By refusing the Medicaid expansion, we're not saving Utah taxpayers any money in right. what's being paid in taxes under the Affordable Care Act. We're just saying we don't want it back here. Send it to Ohio right. or... Being basically our health care money is going to take care of people in California or Colorado or New yes. Mexico or Michigan or wherever. That's Absolutely. Right. Good point. So, so, Danny, you mentioned this work component, and that's been a sticking point here, that Governor Herbert wanted to include in the Healthy Utah Plan this component that, that people who could work would work. And that right. seems to be something that's not really part of the Medicaid expansion overall. And, and where are we at in terms of working that out? So Medicaid has been around for 50 years next year, and never in the history of that program has somebody's work status uh, been tied to their eligibility for Medicaid. And the federal government has basically said, we're not going to, to start that now uh, with the Medicaid expansion. A number of states have been saying, we want to tie those two things together, that if somebody is going to be on Medicaid, they need to be working. And if they're not, and they're able-bodied, then we will cut off their Medicaid benefits. And the federal government's been very clear that they're not going to allow that. Uh, and so part of the biggest holdup with this whole Healthy Utah plan has been negotiations over the summer between the governor's office and the federal government in terms of what, what they would allow. One thing that I think oh. is very crucial to a discussion of the work, in, work requirement or whatever they're calling it now, the work incentive or whatever, is that the, the governor's office in their exploration of this issue when the University of Utah did their study about the people in the coverage gap, they concluded that 66% of them are already working. It, th one of the things that really got me involved in this issue and that I was trying to cover in the film was that there are a lot of stereotypes and ideas out there about these people in the coverage gap and there's a strong feeling that these are lazy people who just don't want to work, who just want to be handed something and the facts just don't support this idea. My experiences with a lot of people in the coverage gap don't support this idea. I haven't been running into people who don't want to work. I've been running into people who are working three jobs to support their children. A, a one woman, woman who's working three jobs and every week has to do a consecutive 72 hour stretch. Wow. To just to support our children, and she cannot get any kind of health care for the two types of cancer she suffers from. This is not a lazy person who just wants to be handed something. This is somebody who is working extremely hard, just trying to stay afloat, and it bothers me that we're getting so hung up on these ideological concepts about these people instead of actually looking at the fact that we are denying some of the hardest working parts of our society, people who just don't, who have jobs, who are working hard but have low paying jobs, we're denying them health care. Th that, that should be a concern to everyone. We, we like to think of ourselves as being a moral state that's about families. I think we are, but if we're denying health care to families who are working hard for it, then we don't really have the right to call ourselves that. Especially as you were saying, we're already paying for it. So Danny, real quick. Yeah, and so Paul's exactly right. The, the, the scope of this problem is actually very small. Two thirds of people, as he mentioned, are, are working and most of those who fall in the other third are not in the employ employment market uh, whatsoever. They're not looking for work because they're either students or they are taking care of children at home. Uh, they're just not in the workforce, and so the scope of the problem is relatively small. And those who are unemployed isn't because they are uh, 
not looking for work, it's because we're coming out of a recession and lots of people are still unemployed and, and especially in that income bracket, it's hard to find work still, so. Well, that, I mean, you raise a really good point that it's, okay, great, it's wonderful to have people work, but what about when there's the next recession and you get laid off? Well, there goes your health care. I mean, right. that's and not, your job going to China doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you're employable. But we do need to take a break. And when we come back, I want to ask about some of the people you interview in the film, because these people are saying things like, gosh, I would love to work if I could only have some medicine. So when we come back, let's, let's take it there. This is Community Roundtable, talking about the new film entitled to life, talking about the Healthy Utah Plan, talking about health care for the uninsured here in Utah. Keep it tuned. We'll be right back. We are back on Community Roundtable, talking with Danny Harris from the AARP, talking with local filmmaker Paul Gibbs. And I want to get into talking about the film, but real quickly, when we left off, we were talking about this work requirement that, that's not going to fly with the feds, and Governor Herbert's come up with a compromise. Tell us about that real quickly. So it's gone from being a re work requirement to being called a work effort. I think when people are enrolled in the Healthy Utah Plan now, They'll be enrolled in a, a program at the same time that will help them look for jobs, that will help them sharpen their uh, job training skills, help them write their resume, those types of things. People will be automatically enrolled in that program if they're able-bodied workers, uh, but they <coughs> will not be allowed to, to cut them off from Medicaid benefits if they are not working. Okay, so very good. Paul, in your film, I mean, people say that over and over again. Just if I could have some meds, if I could have some health care, I'd, I'd be changing the world, I'd be working, I would be doing it all. Yes. Well, th th that, that quote actually comes from Stacey Stanford, who is, to me, she's practically the star of the film because her interview is so powerful. And she, she actually, I'm, I'm very glad that came up because she covers another important part of the people that aren't working, people who who actually are disabled but can't qualify for Medicaid under their disability because they cannot afford to get the diagnosis that says they're disabled. Which just sounds crazy. Yes. Well, it, it absolutely is crazy. And this is a woman who's suffering from a neurodegenerative disorder caused by a car accident that she was in. There are two strong possibilities about what she's suffering from. One would be fatal. The other mm. would be very treatable. She doesn't know which one it is because she can't get the diagnosis. We're, we're talking here about somebody who she was actually told to her face by a member of the Utah Healthcare Reform Task Force that there are all sorts of options for you out there. Well, she's been studying this for three years. They're going looking for every option she has. There are Yes, there, there's charity care out there, and I think the charity care is absolutely wonderful, but you can't go to a free clinic and get MRIs and the sort of extensive specialty care that someone like her needs. That's one of the other things that we're hearing from the opponents is that, oh, charity care covers all of this, churches and everything, charity covers this. Look at my situation. I, I need a kidney transplant, and I was, you know, I had kind of a perfect storm of one being in the right groups and everything to qualify for the Medicaid, the Medicare, and I had an amazing support system that raised over $10,000 for me in charity. And I, I can't begin to express how meaningful that was to me, but at the same time we're talking about $10,000 for two $79,000 surgeries. So $150,000, dollars plus yes. someone gave you the kidney. Yes. Right. But, wow. So, so $10,000 wouldn't have gotten me the surgery in and of itself. And that's to say nothing of the fact that the medications that I'm still on and will be on for the rest of my life, the, the cost of just one of my prescriptions, the main immunosuppressant I'm on, that costs as much per month as rent on a two-bedroom apartment in L.A. Wow. So in your film, you know, speaking of these kinds of issues and some of the folks in your film, there's also stories in your film of people flat out dying for lack yes. of treatment, not even to mention the diagnosis. And you have a doctor from Bountiful who's quite eloquent. Yes, Dr. Ray Ward, who's actually running for Utah State Legislature in November as a Republican, which I'd like to point out to point out that this is not just a purely partisan issue as it's often turned into. There are people on both sides you who have, see the benefits. You have of this. two Republicans in, in your film. Yes. Yeah. 
and and there are others. Uh, another member of the Utah Health Reform Task Force actually told me that he has come around to supporting hmm. the Health of Utah plan. But th this patient of his, Emily Young, was suffering from cancer, and while cancer was in remission because of her financial circumstances where she wasn't covered, she had to stop getting treatment and kind of bank on the idea that it would stay in remission, that it wouldn't come back. Well, it didn't. It came back. And when we did the interview with Dr. Ward, he was saying that she was likely to die without ever getting the care. On the night that we premiered the film, Dr. Ward let us know that she had passed away in that time. And as he said, we don't know for certain that Medicaid could have saved her life, but we know that she would have gotten more care. We'll never know exactly what could have happened if she had health care. Or if she could have lived another 10 years or yes. who knows. Okay, sad but true. Healthy Utah, uh, we're right in the middle of all this. There's this talk of a special session. There's talk of waiting. Again, the longer we wait, the more people get sick and die. So, Danny, where are we at now? Do you see this moving forward? Do you see a special session in the works? Do you have a crystal ball here? If I had to look into my crystal ball, I think that we're looking at early 2015 for this. The, the governor wants to move forward with the plan as, as quickly as possible. The legislature wants to put off the decision as, as long as possible. <laughs> uh, and and to, be, to be honest with you, the last le during the last legislative session, they said, the legislature said, well, we ought to wait until the session is out and have a special session so we can address this. Now, when we're proposing the idea of a special session, they're saying, let's wait until the general session. So. Uh, th we've heard this excuse before, and the fact is we need to look at the issue and we need to, to get moving on it. Well, I wanted to jump in, too, on what Paul said earlier <clears throat> about the, the incentives for people here. Um, you know, they're, they're worried about making this too good for the low-income people. There's no incentive to earn, earn more money yeah. and, and climb out of, of poverty. The fact is, is the way our system is set up now, there are you, you're incentivized, if you're low-income, to if you're a woman, to get pregnant if you need to get health care, because then you would qualify for Medicaid. Or you're, oh, wow. or you're incentivized now as a healthy person who maybe has an illness to, to allow that illness to turn into a disability so that you could get access to health care. Medicaid would then accept you. Uh, if you're a parent and you make just above that threshold of half the poverty level, your incentive is to work less or lose your job so that you could qualify for Medicaid. We have perverse incentives in our system right now. What we need to do is allow people to get the care that they need so that they can work, they can improve their own family situation, get the care that they need, because that's one of the major barriers for people improving their lives is having access to that health care. Well, so, right, very good. We only got about 30 oh. seconds left. So real quickly, your film, you're working on two more films on this issue? Yes. Well, three more, actually. A second Excellent. film in Utah. Then I just got back from North Carolina where I'm making a documentary on their Medicaid expansion, and then I'm doing a similar film in Florida. Excellent. And where can people watch Entitled to Life? They can watch it on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. Just search for Entitled to Life. Entitled to Life. And so, Danny, what's next for you? I'll, I'll keep working on this until we make sure that every person that falls in that, that coverage gap has access to care. And do you see this actually working, the Healthy Utah Plan? It's going to be more complicated, but it will, it will get people access to the care that they need. And it'll put 100,000 more people in better shape. That's right. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much to both of you. Paul Gibbs, local filmmaker, Salt Lake Community College film student. His film, Entitled to Life, you can find it on YouTube. Danny Harris, thank you very much from AARP. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Community Roundtable. If you have comments, if you have a question, maybe you've got a suggestion for a future show, please let us know. Our email address, roundtable at slcctv.com. Dot com. It's as easy as that. Thank you again to our guests. Keep it tuned to SLCC-TV. I'm Nick Burns.